Darkness. It caused our imagination, folks. Let me warn you. If you find yourself here in the woods, late at night in the dark, and you don't want treasure, don't you touch it. Don't check it. Don't even look at it. You walk away. Nothing good ever came out of something shiny in the dark. <laughs> Nick and his nephew learned the hard way that some treasure, as rich as they are, ain't worth taking. <laughs> Start the truck! Start the truck! Shit. Get it in gear! <laughs> <laughs> Shit! Fire! Did that ever work? Corby! <laughs> Boys will be stunned come morning. Oh, hot damn it, it's good to see you. <laughs> You know you're my favorite nephew, right? I'm your only nephew. Smart ass. What you driving? I got it. Got it. You always was a smart one. 
I know you want to know where I buried my treasure. All my riches. If you had any riches, you could have paid your bail. I ain't a story. Nobody knows where it is. Go get it, you know. What's that? What's that? No, no. You just sit here. What the hell? What's going on? Boy, you stay in that truck now, you hear? What is it? Shut that door. <laughs> Scoot on over. You're done driving for tonight. It ain't a thing. You understand? It ain't a thing. What you got to eat around here? We got canned stuff in the pantry, bologna and cheese in the cooler. Oh, yeah, you're going to want to make me one of those with some mayonnaise on it. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to rest my eyes here in this chair. So, what you been up to? Getting any trouble? Some. Your mama said you broke a boy's arm. Not really. Oh, yeah, I bet. You all roughhousing? He fell is all. It's not like I hit him with a tire iron. Hey, now, uh, that is enough. Wasn't a tire iron. Well, you go and take a bedroom. I'll lay out here. You sure? Yeah, I, I'm not that tired anyhow. You know, jail and all. Right. Night, Uncle. Sure is hell going to believe my stories now. Shit.
I never did like pipe smoking. I don't know how your daddy liked it. Too rich for me, I guess. You remember where we spread your daddy's ashes? My treasure is on the back side of that tree. It's all I'll ever give you. And you're a smart one. You wait a bit before you dig it up. I am going to take the truck in the morning. And you are going to walk down the creek to the Red Mule Station and call your mom to come get you. Just coyotes. I ain't heard no coyotes, though.
<laughs> Take my advice. You leave that treasure in the woods right where you found it. Or you're going to look over your shoulder one day in that dark cloud. It's going to take you right out of this world. Go on. Uh, Trenton Minot, um, I guess I'm here for my film uncle, Mark. It had been a while since I had made a short film, right? And this was kind of post COVID and uh, I had felt like I hadn't wrote near enough during the lockdown and, pa and pandemic and stuff. So toward the end of it, I like sat down and had, uh, wanted to write a short. And so that's where I started. Well, fortunately, um, I, I work in the industry, right? So I'm, I have a lot of friends. I was able to wrap most of my film, professional film friends into coming and helping me. So, you know, we were able to kind of get that quality of the film a little top notch. Does being in the industry help? I think so, because I'm able to have favors and people who are the professionals are way more open to helping me in any capacity than I think if I hadn't worked professionally. Um, but that's also kind of my I think I lean more of that is my end goal, right? Like if, if I fail at making money as a filmmaker, you know, I will probably stick in the industry for, for life because it's a lifestyle, right? Like being in the film industry is, is you have to love it or you're gonna hate it. So I, I think I'm one of those people who do love it. So uh, being in the industry has helped me quite a bit, I think. It's also New Orleans too. We could talk about how New Orleans is great and kind of tight knit and, you know, I know a lot of people from the other major production cities who aren't as tight-knit or close and don't collaborate with each other on personal projects. So that is something that's rather unique to New Orleans too, at least I think so. Uncle was truly practiced. A couple things, like I, I'm not a huge horror movie fan, right? But I, I wanted to see if I could do something that was kind of in the horror comedy realm. So everything about Uncle, at least me writing it and doing it and making it, was all practice. I just, I wanted to see if I could. And so the price tag for me was justified of, it was an investment in myself. I, I, I never figured it would do well in the festival circuit. It just didn't enter my mind, right? I wanted to make it for myself and I did. Uh, a lot of people enjoyed it, so that was great. But yeah, it, it was practice to see if I could pull it off, pull it off in the time, pull it off with like, the kind of the budget constraints that I had made myself and then also to do it with my professional friends and and see what they think and I, I think all of those boxes were checked in terms of like maybe where I wish I had I learned and wish I had done more was more horror aspects more some more brutality and some more blood like I do think when my character um, uncle John Neisler gets killed I wish I had done something a little more gruesome, but that was also where my expertise had ended. I'm not, a, again, not practiced with gore and blood and all that stuff. And so I wish we had pursued that a little harder and done a little more. But that's what I learned, you know, doing the movie of like, I needed that, so.
Morning. Morning. What you up to? Nothing. Everything okay? Yeah. All right, what's on your mind? It's early. Do we have to start this now? Start what? I'm just asking how you doing. You're fishing for there to be something wrong. Well, I mean, you never tell me when something is wrong. Because there's nothing wrong. Yeah, you're right. It is too early. You know, we haven't been out in a while. We should do that. Uh-huh. You remember that nice little Italian place where the owner comes to every table? Oh, yeah. I hate that place. What? Why? They always pressure you to order the specials instead of what you want to order, and they're just overly cheerful about it. <laughs> you talking about when they gave you veal? I didn't really think it was that funny. I wasn't... I wasn't trying to make this into something. Neither was I. I'm sorry. I think dinner sounds great. Hey, I'm sorry I got uh, caught up. I figured. I ate anyway. Oh, damn, dinner. I forgot. It's fine. So, uh, what'd you do? Nothing. Just hung out. Just hung out. All right, what's on your mind? There's nothing wrong. No, Riley, clearly there's something wrong. Is it about dinner? Because I thought you said you didn't even want to go. Still, an update would be nice. Okay, I said I got caught up. Okay, and I'm just explaining myself to you. You never text me or anything when you're with other people. Oh, come on, Riley, I'm always with you. I'm not even saying that. No, you can't just, just this, this isn't fair. You can't just make me feel guilty about hanging with other people. I'm not doing that. I'm just saying if you wanted to cancel, that's fine. Just say something. Okay. You made your point. You were asking what was wrong. God, Riley. What's your issue? All right, it's like this every day. What? Nothing, nothing. You just... I just what? You're just never going to change. All right, we've been arguing like this for months. Well, you have no idea what I'm going through right now. Because you never tell me. You never listen. Riley, all I do is listen. I want to help you. I don't feel like arguing anymore. Okay.
Hey. Just getting some water. No, no, wait, wait. What? What's up? I wanted to apologize about earlier. If it helps, I, I had a real shitty time. That does help because I had a great time. Oh, yeah. You want to get Chinese tomorrow? We can go to that buffet place. You know, where the sweet tea is way too sweet and the food be sticking together. And somehow there's always that one huge family having a birthday party. Yeah, and they be singing happy birthday with their little portable radio. Oh, that plays the song way too loud? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll go. Only if I get to say it's your birthday. That's cool. you got to sing. What the hell you doing? Damn, that hurt. Riley. I was scratching your face. I I'm sorry, my nails must be sharper than I thought. I'm going to bed. I'm sorry, I didn't. That's no, fine. All right, good night. What's going on? Riley, please talk to me, all right? What happened? Riley, I need you to talk to me, okay? Did you, did you hurt yourself? Okay, um, just, just stay right here, all right? I'm gonna go call 911. Why are you so 
desperate to make this work when it's never going to. with someone who understands. Well, I'm trying. I, I've been trying to be that someone for you. I, I don't know what else I can do. My name is Nick Manning, and I'm the director of Paints Peeling. So it started as a COVID project, because that's when we were you know, doing pre-production and filming it during the midst of COVID. 
and we wanted to keep it simple and I was living with someone at the time and so we wanted to make a movie about the how um, you know people two people stuck together like forced to be stuck together can maybe affect their relationship in a negative way and we also wanted to implement like a body horror aspect to it because we're such big fans of horror and um, I've always wanted to make a horror film. It went smooth uh, and I would say a lot of that has to do with we shot in the house I was living in so we didn't have to deal with any location issues and uh, you know we had a small experienced crew people who I worked with before uh, but the biggest help was that I was actually able to rehearse with the actors like a couple times beforehand and so like we didn't have to deal with any sort of like blocking issues or like doing multiple takes over and over again because we kind of went into each day knowing what we wanted to accomplish for that day. I think uh, making short films is really important especially if you want to tackle a creative role in larger productions later on. I think it's really good practice. I think it's a really good way to meet other people to make films with. Um, and it's just a great way to learn all the different positions on set because the stakes are lower. Um, for instance, when I started UNO, I was doing lighting. And then I moved on to doing like ADing and then like directing and producing all that. And so doing short films gives you a chance to really experiment and find your place in film. So I was happy with the way the film came out. Um, we did submit it to a few festivals. Um, you know, in the UNO Film Festival, it won uh, Best Actress. So I was really happy about that. I think she, Allie did such a great job with that. And uh, I did submit it to some other festivals like New Orleans. It didn't get in. But I'm still happy with the way it turned out. And um, I, if I could do anything, I, I kind of wish I went a little further with the special effects at the end. But I don't know, uh, people have told me that that was just enough because it's kind of hard to watch at the end, but I, I, I wish we went a little further with it, for sure. Right now I'm working in the office. I'm hoping to make my way up in the office space, but um, I would like to go back to independent filmmaking and keep honing that craft because I'm still interested in directing and writing and all that. I think when you start working, you start to like forget about that and you're just focusing on your work, but um, I need to, you need some kind of creative outlet, so it would be nice to get back to it at some point. Film school was just a great way of forcing you to do that. Welcome. My name is David Winters Collada the First. When I was in high school, I created a short film entitled Lasagna about an ancient artifact known only as Lasagna. It resembled a DVD case. And when opened, it would suck its user into a world of cascading and spiraling madness until the entire universe and every universe was destroyed. Since then, I have created one 45 minute short, one 100 minute feature film, another 45 minute short, one 27 minute TV pilot, and one 20 minute documentary, all set within the cinematic universe, set up within Lasagna. This is The Lasagna Show. Welcome back to The Lasagna Show. Our next guest tonight is world-renowned performance artist, political activist, and creator of The Showstopper Project. Ladies and gentlemen, may I humbly present to you the man behind and in front of the curtain, the one, the only, Gonzo Green! Thank you, thank you. Welcome, we're very glad to have you here tonight. Yes, it's, uh, it's very good to be here. We're, we're quite honored to have you here. You're Quite a tough guy to track down. Yes, uh, I don't get out much, but the lasagna show? How can I pass that on? You're too kind. All right, now let's jump right into it. This is you. Yes, uh, that's me. Care to elaborate? 
Right, uh, so that's me as the showstopper. It was a character I created to be the world's first supervillain. Right. Now, you've recently been described by LNN as a dangerous, babbling, nonsensical maniac. Make no mistake, the artist known as Gonzo Green is not an artist masquerading as a terrorist, but a terrorist masquerading as an artist. How do you respond to that label? Terrorist. Well, I'm an artist first and foremost. Everything else comes after that. But the definition of a terrorist? I don't know. A, a terrorist terrorizes. Are horror directors terrorists? Are scary clowns terrorists? Are you a terrorist? Well, I, I've i never incited riots. I've never... <laughs> I've never killed anyone. And I don't encourage violence of any kind. I just like creating characters. The world's first supervillain, right? If you're going to change the world, you might as well do it with a little pizzazz. I think, uh, I think we have a clip. Welcome to the showstopper project. The world's on fire and the flames only getting hotter. It's all a bad joke and nobody's laughing. And we should, we should be laughing. Because it's funny. The world's on fire, and I'm going to add to Because it's funny. It's funny. It's funny. To those of you just tuning in, what you just witnessed was footage broadcast live by terrorist Gonzo Green, a.k.a. The Showstopper, issuing a vague threat against American citizens. Joining us now to discuss this footage is political activist and self-proclaimed superhero, Interrobang. Thank you, Interrobang. We're glad to have you here tonight. Thank you. It's good to be here. Now, what can you tell us about Gonzo Green and your experience working against him? Well, Gonzo Green is a nihilist. He doesn't care about institutions. He doesn't care about human lives. He only cares about one thing, attention. What do you think is the worst thing Gonzo would do in order to get attention? The question isn't what would he do. The question is, what wouldn't he do? Truly disturbing. Now, can you tell us anything about Gonzo's latest work, The Showstopper Project? Uh, right. Um, the, the Showstopper Project. Ladies and gentlemen, arsonists and thieves, criminals of all ages, may I humbly present to you, in Bang! <laughs> What's the matter? The only voice of reason left in the world suddenly can't find anything to say? Aw, oh, I knew that was bad, but it didn't give you the invitation to interrupt me. <laughs> Let this be a lesson to all those that dare stand in the way of art. You point and laugh at all sorts of madness and horrors you see on television. But as soon as it's real, it's a whole different story. Well, this is my story now, and none of it is real. <laughs> Ta-da! My name is Alexander Socrates Margot. I'm an adventurer, philosopher, metaphysician, and as I've recently discovered, fictional character in this book. I don't know where this book came from, but everything written in it is true, perfectly transcribed. Events no one other than myself could possibly... If I'm not real, I have to figure out what's going on. The author of the book, she was a character in a TV show recorded to this VHS tape. There seem to be layers to all of this, and there must be some way to climb them. In my studies, I've discovered to known only as lasagna through a world of cascading and maddening reality, real world, where their minds are ultimately destroyed. Maybe my only studying lasagna, the more I come to understand. I'm but one man, but there's an infinity out there. Even if I am real, I don't think I matter. I don't think any of this matters. But I really hope I'm wrong. Eureka! Reality is lasagna. Layers of top layers. Continuities within continuity. Has created a device. Derivative of lasagna. Peel back the layer. Reach the base reality. The unfortunate possibility that all of reality is destroyed. But if none of this is real, then it doesn't matter anyway. Call myself Dr. Nihilus. 
I'm going to pretend to be insane. the full power of my device, which the world will soon come to know as Meatloaf! Wow, that's, uh, that's a lot to take in. Yes, uh, I know it can be a bit much for most, but hopefully people can soon come to see the world the way I do. How exactly is that? Well, once I figured out that none of this is real, it became a lot easier to make my art. What do you mean, none of this is real? My first character, Dr. Nihilus. He was my first attempt at a supervillain. And he was all right, but it wasn't until after my failed attempt to destroy the universe. I, I remember that! You, you held the world hostage with that, um, that device! Meatloaf? Yes, yes! Um, whatever happened to that thing? It was taken from me, but through using it, I was able to access a world beyond our reality. A world I never knew existed before being chewed up and spit out here. This just in exclusive footage of what is believed to be an interdimensional rift. The identity of the individual who emerged from the rift is unclear, although it is apparent he is not from this world. At the crossroads between existence and conception, nowhere in the physical world, nowhere you could possibly imagine, there exists a realm connecting all realities, possible and impossible, fiction and non. Over the centuries, it's been known by many names. The Bardo, the Twilight Zone, the World Between Worlds, a purgatory surrealist nightmare. Well, well, what do you call it? I call it Elsewhere. There exists an audience watching everything. That's where our creator came from. That's where lasagna came from. And I'm going to get there. I'm going to take it from him. And I'm going to break out of this reality. I realized it didn't matter what I did or didn't do. It was all just a fantasy, a game, a tale told by an idiot. Told by who? By whom? I know you're watching. I know you don't care. Everything that's happened, you've allowed it to happen. And everything that's gone wrong is your fault. This is your story, and you can let it play out however you want. But your story needs a villain. And if you don't step in, I'm going to destroy everything you've created until you do. You want to fight? I'll bring you a war. Soon you'll understand. None of your petty lives matter. You're all just characters. Killing you is the same as killing ants. Soon you'll understand how genius my art is. Soon you'll worship me. I'll make you worship me. Gonzo Green is his name, the performance artist taking the world by storm, claiming to create the world's first supervillain. Welcome, Gonzo. We're glad to have you here tonight. I'm so sorry, but Gonzo couldn't be here tonight, so I'm taking his place. Oh, -ho! and who might you be? I'm the showstopper, the world's first supervillain. And what do you have to say for us tonight, showstopper? I have a threat for a man I know is listening. And who might that? His name is David Winters Collada the First. He created me, he created you. Is he God? <laughs> no, he's a fool, a child who picked up a pencil, a film student who wrote himself into his own film like some sort of jackass. But that was his mistake. There is a way out of this world. The fourth wall was not built by a God. But by a man. Then men can be manipulated. And men can be killed. I fought him once before, in Elsewhere. But due to the circumstances, I was unable to take his place. How would you take his place? Come on. Do you really think it's a coincidence we're entirely identical? I, I don't know. I, I guess I just thought. I'm going to break out of here. I'll take over this body, play you for a change. You're too unstable, too far gone. You can't play all of us at once. Not like he can. Not like God, 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 God. Not like Gonzo. David Winters Collada the First. Admit it, you're fake too. Invented by the real David to hide behind. Like the coward, like the coward he is. We're in a film, and a shitty one at that. You see, going to elsewhere allowed me to see the strings to see the cameras. David plays me, but 
He didn't think this thing all the way through. After all this time, I finally found it. That's why I agreed to come on the show tonight. I finally found lasagna. I'm in control now. I don't have to go through elsewhere. I can move through realities however I want. I can play multiple characters at once. I can play the showstopper in all of his different incarnations. I can play you. Ah, it is good to be back. It's good to see you, old friend. Are we moving on up? Well, he's right behind that camera. Wonderful. Shall we? We shall. You're next, buddy. And cut. And that's a wrap. Great work, everybody. Really appreciate all of your hard work. Um, it really means a lot to me. Um, I know this project is a bit ridiculous, no, but... absolutely not. You think this is over? This is just getting started. Sorry, guys, I'm not quite oh, well, you sure. You know exactly what's going on. You wrote the thing, didn't you? Yeah, the lasagna show, but this... Enough! I've had it with you. Playing God for so long, you've started to deify yourself, you puny, weak child. That's big talk from somebody who doesn't exist. How do you people stand him? And all these silly faces, voices all the time, non-stop. Do you not get tired? Do you want to know what the Showstopper Project really is? His show stops. Permanent. Stops right now. Easy, big fella. I don't think you want to do that. You bastard. I have my moments. You wouldn't. Try me. Wait. This isn't real. Cut! No! Hi everybody, my name is David Collada, the director of The Lasagna Show. This is The Lasagna Show. Um, so I had had the idea from uh, about freshman year of college that by the end of my college career, I wanted to wrap up this sort of uh, series that I had created of a bunch of different films set in the sort of like same universe. Um, and I knew from my senior film from the very beginning that I wanted it to be this like big, weird, like uh, amalgamation of everything that by the end hopefully sort of felt like a blockbuster, even in the weirdest possible way. Um, and uh, yeah, I knew, I mean, I knew I wanted to play every character too, and it just became this sort of super weird niche, hopefully cool, uh, hopefully cool thing. From everything that I had ever written and directed, I always wrote roles for myself. Because I've been doing that for so long on set, I, I had been pretty used to it for a while of like what that looked like. Um, the multiple roles in the same scene was pretty new, um, but I had a bunch of great conversations with uh, crew leading up to it. So by the time we were actually shooting, even though the script was super bizarre, everybody was pretty on the same page of like, okay, David knows exactly what he wants on this. So like, once we all got on the same page, it, it was pretty smooth sailing from there. I'd say d directing a short film is, I think, a great place to start. It is a really good way to, um, instead of like with directing a feature or a larger, a larger piece, you use whatever resources you have and, and sort of spread it thin across an hour and a half or two hours or whatever. But if you're, if you're getting new to it or um, you know, have finite resources, it is a better way to focus uh, whatever you, what, what you may be spreading thin across such a larger production to really focus it on a smaller, um, on a smaller amount of time to re which really brings the production value up a, a lot higher. I was really happy with the final product. Um, it really became something that was sort of exactly what I wanted it to be. 
um, it it sort of functioned as, like I said, it, it had been something that I had been looking forward to from, you know, even even after graduating high school, like that summer before freshman year, wanting to do film and being like, okay, so I, I want to do this, this, this. I know I want to do this at the very end, so how do I work backwards and set that up? So by the time I finally got there and finally had this piece that to me represented the culmination of like all of the films that I had done before then, um, it just, I was really, really happy with it. I felt like I picked the best crew that I could have, and um, by the time everything came together, I was, I was really, really happy with it.
Well, folks, I'm going down to St. James Infirmary. Take a part of bound and put it back together. Vision, testicles ready, penis already went through circumcision. Heavy competition, vocals just got out the house of detention. Governor linebacker with the gold jock strap, I play ball for Clinton. I'm like a dog chasing my own tail, spinning, Dr. Incline. Jack off in the mothership, pass it, check off the Frankenstein. The red Dodge Ram run over football players at the field goal line. Juicy inside, the girls like when I orange peel off their mind. If you can see ghosts, I'm Sean Carter in his prime. Whipple to stadium, let the seat recline. Superstar like Ernest Borg, nah. Dr. Octo, art like Picasso, Operation Zero, orchestrate material. Dr. Octo, art like Picasso, orchestration material. Dr. Octo, art like Picasso, Operation Zero, orchestration material. Dr. Octo, art like Picasso, orchestration material. Into the Pentagon, stained like a blood clot. You see me with flashlights walking through the fog. Woman on newspaper sitting down peeing hard. Eyeballs get wide, everything re large. Master charge holds a condom with the iPod. Brain massage through my prostate, oh my God. Frank Belusha, see inside, pink fuchsia. DNA drop the birth control on computer. You wait for x-rays, having sex with a neck brace. She on the Audubon, speeding with a tampon. Hexagon pulling over while she tricking the John. I'm Don Juan, catching panties like Lynn Swan. I'm a fan of Spawn. Shot right in Long John's, I need the lexicon. Walk inside with leprechaun, green and more. Jelly beans, we want more. Dr. Octo, art like Picasso, Operation Zero, orchestrate material. Dr. Octo, art like Picasso, orchestration material. Dr. Octo, art like Picasso, Operation Zero, orchestration material. Dr. Octo, art like Picasso, orchestration material. Need to let go of these mics, Pandora's box. I wear the moose with lime green fox. Tires look like Hydrox. The white shoes with black socks. Mountain Dew recording vocals with the chicken box. Pots on the stove, smoking, can't turn chicken off. Packed up bags, moving out the body bags. Freckle faced up, popping electric boogie. Pedal bike behind trucks, you see the black hoodie. Great coat with the antidote, I'm hunting antelope. Sitting up at nighttime with goggles, eating cantaloupe. 
making left and rights, seeing people with tights, ballerinas, legs and wings, I'm the colonel from Kentucky Fried, the doctor wears tux with a lot of pride. Doctor, I go art like Picasso, Operation Zero, orchestrate material. Doctor, I go art like Picasso, orchestration material. Doctor, I go art like Picasso, Operation Zero, orchestration material. Doctor, I go art like Picasso, orchestration material. So you're a filmmaker, huh? Sitting around with your partners talking about, well, I'ma shoot this or I'ma shoot that. You ain't shooting shit. Talking about you need ADR and my soundtrack music ain't right. You're not making movies if nobody ain't seeing. Get the shit done, you bullshit. Send us your film, time code Nolan, you heard me?